I am interviewing Mr. Bertel, Bert Miller of Route 2 Withy and Bertel, B-E-R-T-E-L, Miller, capital M-I-L-L-E-R. And this is December 19, 1984. With him is also his wife, Olive. Okay, Bert, would you tell us, first of all, where you were born and when you were born and where? I was born in the town of Hickson, next door to where I'm living now, about 1911, June 9th. Okay. And I spent most of my young days at that place. What were your parents' names? My dad's name was Thomas Miller, and my mother was Grace Miller. Before she was married? No. Okay. Did you always live here, or uh, have you lived someplace else in the township? I've always lived. This has always been my home. <coughs> Did I mean, your father have land someplace else? <clears throat> no, they had the farm, and they started up the farm, and they had that all through his life at that one spot. Okay, where did you attend school? At the Frenchtown School in the town of Hickson. Do you recall some of your teachers that stand out in your mind? Oh, there was a Mrs. Tiedemann, a Mrs. Baker, and the Skinner sisters, Mrs. Means, and Mrs. Harry Johnson. Mrs. Oh, all so that covers pretty much <coughs> the life at the eighth grade. I went to, to an eighth grade two-room school. This kept the teachers and the two. How many students were actually in your grade usually? About from eight to thirteen. That's a pretty good size grade. Mm -hmm. Now, after you got out of uh, school, what did you do during this time before you wound up going into the service? After I got out of school, <clears throat> I started right in doing, helping on the farm and also carpenter work. So, more or less, I grew up with it. Was your dad a carpenter? My dad was a carpenter ahead of me when I would, I started out right out of the eighth grade uh, helping him and working with him until I was able to go off on my own. So it was on the job training right away then that you grew yes, up? Yes, started right on the job. Oh, well that's, that's a good good way to learn. Did you, uh, this, you strictly were kind of self-taught then along with your father. You didn't that's, have any other training. That's not until I got out and started working for contractors. What, uh, when you worked for contractors, where did you work and what kind of things were you building? Most of it was barn building in the area around, around Withy. And uh, <clears throat> one of the first years I carpentered was the year of the 1930 of the tornado. And we had a series of barns that had to be rebuilt that year. And our pretty much was the sole work was rebuilding of barns. Which barns around here, can you name someone that's maybe on the farm now or that you knew was on the farm or approximately where it's at that we might be able to identify the location? Might, might have been a barn that you well, one of, build? <clears throat> one of the barns was the Myron Caskin barn. We were building that at the time of the tornado and we had some damage, but we had to rebuild that and completed that one. Uh, Donald Hawks barn, the barn on the Jens Miller, uh, <coughs> Jens Miller farm up north of Withy on the Jens A. Miller, the home, Miller homestead. Also the one on the Bartosiak place who had purchased the one that was at one time was the Smith Roller Ridge. That was one that blew down and was rebuilt that one year. Where, whereabouts was this located, the Smith Roller Ridge? That is in three and a half, three and a quarter miles north of Withy. It's on a... Would that be near uh, uh, at Ingle? No, or it's on the... To, no, it's past your place. It is up there at um, past Emil Rowland's place up there, the next farm north, where Zowles lived. Oh! And that barn was rebuilt. In that blew down with the tornado. Was that actually a roller rink there? But before that, the Smiths had built it, and they had a roller rink in there for many, many years. I never heard that before. Yeah. And uh, that was one of the more popular places for the young people. There would be roller skating up there on Sundays, also several evenings a week, mm -hmm. and also dances. I never realized we had a you know lively place north of Withy. Yeah. <laughs> Any other places that you can think of? How did you ever learn to build? You know, you have built the cupboards in our house and in lots of other homes too. Where did you ever learn to do cabinetry? 
I think we just learned. That is about all I can say on that. We picked it up. Uh, the first, <clears throat> some of the first cabinets I made, they were totally all made by hand. There was no routers or any tools like such as that. It was not even a bench saw. So everything was ripped out by hand and plain and hand plain and fitted together. And I think, I don't know, no record of it, but I have put several sets of covers together where we had nothing more than the hand saw and planes. And you need all of these here. Uh, that's, uh, so that is one of the, in them days we very seldom had a, any power tools of any kind for cabinet work. And of course I kind of grew up with buying tools and making covers accordingly. To did you generally use uh, nails to put the cabinets together or did you tend to use wooden pegs? Or, or <coughs> there was quite a like few na nails were used and the first cupboards we built was um, pretty much put together with uh, nails <coughs> and they were framed up with one by two strips and we would a lot of times pick them up from the lumber yard and rip them that size and then they would be strips made for holding the shelving up. The doors were generally cut out by hand and just with a plain square edge and fitted in with. And, uh, there was very little, very little plywood used and in those days there was no not any paneling available, but there was some plywood in quarter inch and well mostly it was only quarter inches. The first years I worked, I think quarter was the only size that was available. Some years later then paneling started coming in. And Made it a lot easier years later than with, with the plywood to work with. Oh yes, it, it has been a tremendous help since they have come in with plywood and, and the power tools. One of the in house building, I can remember some of the. I can remember when they brought sheetrock into the introduced sheetrock, and we were had to go to a school at Stanley in order to learn how to put it on. It was the first to use sheetrock. Before that, there was no nothing but either lath and plaster of the houses, or else uh, put on some kind of a Cornell wall board that was made up at Cornell that would like a heavy cardboard. That is the days before paneling even. And uh, then fiberboard came out, and some years later, then the paneling came out, and we could start begin getting paneling that you could put on the walls to finish off the walls. But uh, some of the first years, there was a Cornell wall board that was probably about five sixteenths, to, from three sixteenths to five sixteenths thick, and it was made up at Cornell, and it was nothing but a heavy cardboard with a, a high grade of cardboard with a gloss finish on it, and that you could put up and four by eight sheets and put batten strips on it and make a fairly decent looking wall until it would buckle, but it would, over a few years, it would start buckling. And if there wasn't a solid backing behind it, it was, would be terrific, but terrific buckling. And that, I guess, is a thing of the past. Now, there was a lot of this insulating board was made up into decorative patterns, and it, <laughs> you could buy that in a large sheet and they had a special tool that you could buy. You could rip it at different widths and you could cut grooves in it so it would make different designs and panelings to make it a decorative wall. That was used up in the early 30s. Now these are beautiful cabinets that you have in your home here. Uh, what kind of wood is this? These are <coughs> wood that was quite popular for many years and that is a birch, the white birch. A uh, yellow birch, I mean. These are all yellow birch cabinets. Did a very nice job of it, too. Yeah, organization. Uh, the yellow birch on the, the drawers, is that a yellow birch cabinet? No, or is that kind of an no oak these oak here, we, we cheat a little on these here. That's <laughs> oak. That is a, built in the time when money was just a little bit tight and I had some oak to finish up with and that's what we used. The whole thing goes yeah. together very nicely. Yeah, uh-huh. No, you can take a lot of pride in yeah. having done it yourself. This is what a lot of us can't do. <laughs> That's why we have to hire you to come do ours. <laughs> um, now, between the time when you graduated and you worked with your dad and worked with the different uh, kinds of woods and things, and then you were called off to the service. And let's see now, before this time, uh, where did you meet Olive along the way? How did, how did you two meet, Alice? We were at a teaching school up here at Frenchtown. Okay, now, see, were you from this area, or where were you from? No, from the uh, t uh, country town of Thorpe area, out in Clark County. 
between Sandy and Thorpe is where where I lived, born and lived, raised. Mm -hmm. He went to school there to the Peterson School it was called. And then I went to high school in Sandy, graduated from there. Where did you go to teachers college someplace? No. At that time you didn't have we had teachers training in school in, in, school. in high school. The last two years of our senior and junior and senior year we had teachers training. And uh, we learned from uh, some of the teachers and some of the trainers, one of the teachers that were training, and uh, going to the classes and studying the classes and what they did and what could be improved and stuff like that, you know. Then you taught at Frenchtown? Yeah. And that's how, that's where you met Bert? Yeah, so I met Bert, but I taught to, I had, a, I taught at our home school before I came up here at the, uh, at the Peterson School it was called. That was all eight grades, one, one schoolhouse, mm -hmm. one room. But when I got up here, there was two rooms. Two big rooms, rooms here. Yeah. So, it's so uh, I had, she had the upper room I had here. The upper room. Mm. So let's see, were you married before? Yeah, you were married before you went in the service then? Yes. Okay, what branch of the service were you in? And I was in the engineers. Do? I was drafted in the combat engineers and then was transferred to the utility engineers, maintenance. He was married long enough before he went in so that um, we had a son, Roger, born to us, and he was six months old when you went in? Yes. And he didn't come back until he was three years old. Two and a half. Three and a half years old. You saw his dad from the time he went in. And that same thing. That was really a get, get acquainted when he came back. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't have any leave from from uh, service. He went that way. Where were you down Louisiana? Where was it? Where you had your training? She never got to see me while I, I was in service. Yeah. What what years were you in the service? I went in in <clears throat> forty three, January forty three, and come out at the last days of forty five. Yeah, I never saw him once in that time after that long me. time. And Roger was. Three and a half years old when he came home, wasn't he? Hmm. And that's no. the first he saw his dad and learned to know him. I was no more into the service, <clears throat> and it's just nice to start my basic. I had about two weeks of basic in when I was notified that I was going to be transferred. And I was <clears throat> taken, sent up to, first I was taken, called up to headquarters, and I was given a test, and it happened to be a carpenter test, so then I figured that. <laughs> and I smelled a rat, and a week later I was told that I was confined to the area because I was being transferred, and then I transferred to a uh, group that was getting waiting to ship overseas. So I missed most of all my basic training. That was another reason why there was no passes or furloughs while I was in the country, United States. I never saw him the day he left and went away, and, and uh, three and a half years later. <coughs> so it was near, it's, <coughs> we were on the water going overseas, there was around between 10 and 12,000 GIs on this boat that I traveled on, we traveled alone, and we was on the water for 43 days, mm -hmm. and uh, we went a long way around, we went out of Frisco and we ended up over in Egypt, and as <coughs> soon as we got to Egypt I was, I, we <coughs> landed at the Camp Russell B. Huckstep camp over in Egypt, and I was put at the carpenter shop foreman that they had, it hadn't been set up yet, there was just a few, I think five or six natives were the only one we had working there. We had to set up the carpenter shop and maintain the camp. We took this camp over right from the army engineers that had, supposed to, had built it, and uh, we were the first troops that were operating it. Beautiful day we got turning on. This is for being in December. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How long uh, were you in Egypt then? I was there, I think it was 30 or 31 months, right in the one. Right in the same camp all the yeah. time? Same camp, same, yeah, same three, room, same three shop. Three years it mm -hmm. was. Did you have any, um, well, were there any. Um, I'm going to say dates are raised in Egypt a lot. Did you ever run into any problems eating dates? Egypt at all? Oh, yes. I am a great lover of dates. And uh, you could see these date trees growing along the, the, these canals or wherever there was an oasis. And uh, we had, in our carpenter shop there, we 
had acquired from 35 to 40 of the native Egyptians to help work with us. And we got to where we could speak some English, some Arabic, and they could speak some English. And I asked them once if they couldn't bring me in some of those because they were picking them all along. You'd see them picking them, and they were not beautiful red. And I thought, boy, off the tree, they would really be something to eat. So they said they could. So the next morning, they brought them in. And I could see there was a sort of a grin on their faces. But So I set them on the desk, and when after they all got put to work, they were kind of watching me, and I tried to eat them. And they're just like eating sawdust and wood. No, you were right. A popple. They have to lay in weather for, I don't know how long they didn't hang in order to ripen, but they're not ripe when they're picked. I found that out. Okay. There uh, yeah, are different kinds, too. And yeah. Some are better but those over there were very, were just about like a piece of <laughs> soft wood. Sawdust. Uh -huh. We uh, used it <coughs> from 35 to 40 of the natives over there, and many of those were working where their tools over there were the old wooden plane and a, a sort of a buck saw. They were not used to any of our modern tools. And if you saw a board, until they got used to the American way of it, they would mark it and they would saw, start on the saw backwards. They'd saw away from them all the time, instead of towards us as all Americans did. But they did adapt to the power tool very quickly. Were there any other uh, soldiers there that were from the area here? Yes, there was some. Um, not from the immediate area. From the county or? No, no, we had to. Can no. I go in and watch the TV? Uh, let's see, Al, do you want to, let's just kind of jump back to here a little bit. Well, Bert was in Egypt and you were living here yeah. and teaching school or at the same time? Yeah. Um, no, just one year. Huh? What? Just one year. Oh. Okay, what was your maiden name before you were married? Warden. Warden. W-A-R-D-E-N. And when was your, when is your birth date? December 31st. Coming up in a few days. And you'll be how eight, I'll be eighty years old now. Eighty grand years. Yeah. <laughs> I'm older than birthday. So we we'll, we'll wish you a happy birthday a couple days early. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <coughs> um, okay, the once you got out of the service in nineteen forty six, you say? Nineteen forty six. Okay, then you came back to the area and are there any what uh, when you came back here did you go back into carpentry again? No, we went, <coughs> shortly before I went into service, we had came over and Mr. V.A. Hanson and Withy had wanted us to start up the hardware store with Withy and Mr. Elberts was selling out, so he wanted to start a hardware store, so we came and took the responsibility of transferring that stock over and starting a new hardware store in Withy and we run the, we managed the hardware specialty from 1941 of June, uh, until 1943, as until we was inducted in service. And it was doing that when we was inducted. And then when we came back from service, that work was not available for us anymore. So then my brother Vern, who had worked with me in that store, was had received quite a bit of shrapnel in the service. So we started up a hardware store in Owen, which we operated until my dad became sick in 1950. We started that up in 1946 and we operated that till 1953. Where was that store? In uh, where Looker has his laundromat now. Oh. And then when we had to get home and come out here to help on the home place after my dad had been sick, we sold out then. What Elbert was that that had the I store in Withy? Was that Edgar and Chubb's Edgar father? and Chubb's dad, yes. Yeah, he had a store. He was in the, <coughs> he'd been in the hardware business and with you for many, many years. They had, had a, a large hardware store there at one time that he was one of the three owners of it. And it ended up with just this one small one after the big store burned. So it was a hardware specialty that you, yes. where you had your store? Yeah, we restarted up. You see, the hardware specialty had been originated back in the 20s. And then they had a fire in, 19, in the early, somewhere in the 30s, and burned out, and there was no nothing there at all except office. Viggo used it for office supplies. So then in 41, we started up the hardware specialty and with it. 
are there uh, what other people or places do you recall it where around when you had the uh, hardware store? What other places were in Withy? The she hotels there. there? No. Well, you had the, were there hotels there at the time? At, at that time, the hotels there. <coughs> There was actually not a hotel at all at that time. There was the Duffner Hotel was still up, but it was mostly rented out to uh, people who were living it as uh, living quarters. And it was not used as a hotel. Was uh, there a big lumber yard? Did the own was it Owen Lumber? Was that still? <coughs> yes, the Owen End Lumber had a large lumber yard in Owen. And with the Keel had this large clothing store. Jellings, of course, had a large store on the corner. Harry Torson's Meat Market. Next to the library. The library. Farmer's store was very active. That is Hanson. Where was the farmer's store at? Farmer's store was, uh, oh, let's see, that would be, it is on the north end of town, <coughs> on the southeast, it'd be on the southeast corner of there, just kitty corner across from where the hardware specialty is now, or where the, they now have the lawnmower shop, north of Doc Johnson's. Oh, yeah. Yes, on the opposite corner. Well, it'll be across the street from Lang's office supply now. What other <coughs> places were there in Withy that uh, you recall? There was a, <coughs> John, on the Larson blacksmith shop was just north of where the hardware store was situated. A.R. Martin had a blacksmith shop on the south side of town where he <coughs> did a lot of general hardware plus horseshoeing and a lot of sleigh and wagon repairs. John Sosoba had a shoe repair store plus miscellaneous about in the center of the town, just north of the tracks. I really can't think of any more that were, were there <coughs> at that time. Before that, there was several stores down there that had burnt prior to this time. Okay, once you got quite involved in our uh, educational system here at school, how, now you, you had, uh, let's better just come back here to your children first of all. You had two children, and you want to tell us their names and the boy Roger was born, as we said shortly before I went into service, and Jane was born after we returned from service. So we have this. Okay, then you got involved in the school system here. How did you? Uh, how large was the school system when you got involved in it? When I got involved in the school system was the time they were contemplating building, <coughs> merging the two schools together and building a school between Withy and Owen, or building it somewheres at that time. And one of the first things they did when they were contemplating this was to set up a building, uh, appointing a building committee to work with the school board on that. And I was asked by Mr. Elwin Roberts if I would become involved with this building committee, which I accepted and uh, was active on it until the school was constructed and put into use in 1963. And then the following year, I was asked to run for the school board, and I did, and I was on there for 15 years. Once they found a good man, they just didn't let you go. <laughs> kept you on it. Now, did you receive uh, some kind of an award when you, I think you've probably several awards since you've been off of the school board. <coughs> yes, I received, uh, I did receive the W.C. Junin Award, which was given for recognition on work on the education field. I uh, also was given the Citizens Award from town of Hickson in 1980, or 79 or 80, I can't remember just So that is, I think, the two that are affiliated with the education part of it. Okay, you have a school bell that has... That uh, is, yes, that was uh, given to me as I left the school board after 15 years of service. I have been quite active in the Lions Club, and I have Lion of the Year Award and also a past president award, so I've been quite active in the Lions, which I think was a very good area group for the village of Withy. I agree with that. <laughs> And while I was on the school board, I was quite involved with, at one time I was on the, for the, I think for nine of the 15 years, I was on the CESA Board of Control at Chippewa. That was, that would cover 26 schools that would be under that CESA project that would be operating on special programs through the CESA. And uh, while I was on the CESA Board of Control, I also was appointed to the Area C Policy Committee. That is at Blair, and that would cover 78 schools. That covered three CESAs, so I got... There was a while there that I had quite a few school board meetings in a, in a month, but it was very interesting and in bringing out to different phases. That that kept you really going then with uh, on the school board. That's not just once a month type of meeting. If you really get involved, uh, were there any big school problems that you recall 
during the time? Anything that stands out in your mind? Well, I think there are always school problems. Nothing, nothing that was real major that Not, you just... Nothing uh, too major. I mm -hmm. think the, probably the... What type of wages when you were working um, would they have paid back in the 1930s? <clears throat> about, nine, about 30... For the, for the first year with a contract, it would be about 30 cents an hour was the general wage. And uh, that day's uh, 10 hours was a common day. Anything less than that was only part day work. And the, uh, those with uh, a year of experience, you could probably expect another nickel, 35 cents an hour. And if you got up to 40 or 45, you were on top pay. And that is uh, about as high as the figure you could go. When, when did the wages start to raise a little bit? The 30s were kind of during the Depression, well, 33, during the Depression time. There's a, following that up as the Depression hit, carpenter work, maybe I should clarify that, carpenter work dropped back to where if you did get carpenter work about the most, I think I built two barns where it's all done with hand tools and it's done for 15 cents an hour during the Depression. If you wanted to work, that is about the most you could probably expect and is the most anyone could pay if they did do have the work, unless it was some special occasion. But then in, <clears throat> in 36, 37, about the time the Social Security come in, then wages started raising a little bit, and you could get up 45 cents an hour on most jobs around, up to 50, 55, and 60. In 37, I went over and worked for a construction outfit in Nina, and I was the second high man on the job, and I received 85 cents an hour. And that was uh, one of the better years that I've ever had in my life because the price that you paid, you're paid for things and like that, you would end up with more money at the end of the week at that wage than we could even in the scale of today. What type of wages do they, do people, do carpenters nowadays get? I haven't, <clears throat> I've been out of it now for several years, but I am understand that I guess it runs from 12 to $20 somewhere an hour. A lot of it. That's down, down here in the continental United States. Yes. In Alaska, then it's, it's higher. Yes, it's much yeah. higher when you get out of them. How have you found that, uh, is there any particular things that you have found that this area has changed particularly in? Well, what? outside of the farmers, I guess, farms are getting bigger and less number. And of course, we are getting retirement homes in through the farm area. The way of farming has changed. Today you see corn pickers working out, where them days if somebody had a patch of corn to pick, that is very unusual. Corn was not a popular crop no, to raise. No, not at all popular, and if you would get a ripe corn one year out of ten, you were quite lucky at them days, and now this year they pick it every year. So our weather probably has changed over the years, the, for one thing. The corn and the weather. Yeah, red corn was the 80 day or something like this. Is there anything in this area that just kind of stayed the same? Not you'd have to. <laughs> Withy's has probably gotten smaller. <laughs> well, Withy is, yes, Withy has gone smaller and... It's still conservative. I think we're more or less moving, it's kind of like an urban area, we're moving and traveling farther. The community is spread out where it was a close-knit now, it is with the method of traveling that we, we travel farther. Now, we're quite close to Christmas. What type of Christmas customs and things do you recall? Well, I think most of those I recall were the fact that <clears throat> Pretty much that getting ready for Christmas meant just a day or two before we would get a Christmas tree. There'd be a little baking being done, and you'd get a Christmas tree and put it up the night or day before and get together and visit. I think there was more visiting done in those days than there was an hour. There would be more or less groups get together for family visits and for community and church visits. Christ programs at the school and you know, through the rural schools was quite a large item. Christmas at that time, and looked forward to by most of the people. And as each rural area had their own school, and there they would be a Christmas program, which would be a highlight of getting ready for Christmas. How about the gifts compared to today? What kind of a gift could a youngster expect? Well, if he got one, that he was pretty lucky, and it was generally a pretty small item, more or less a piece of wearing apparel that he would need anyway. Perhaps sometimes it's a tinker toy or pair of skis, something like that would be among the list. How did you decorate the Christmas tree? Most of the time it was done with stringing <clears throat> popcorn, perhaps cranberries, and uh, some, if you're well blessed, you might have a coil of tinsel and that would be put around, saved over from year to year. 
and then they would be lit with a, the old-fashioned candle that we would match your wits in order to get them on so they wouldn't set the tree afire. There was no bottom trees at that time that I can remember. There, there was any place you could buy a tree until for many years. How long, uh, the Christmas custom, you say you started the day before. How long through the holiday did the uh, festivities usually last? Up until the first days of January, as I remember, most of the festivities would stop somewhere between the 1st and the 4th of January. Some churches would have doings up in the first days of January. Some would be in between Christmas and January, and uh, Christmas and New Year's. But a day or two, shortly after New Year's, a custom, most of the festivities of Christmas was ended. I don't know if I asked you, where did your parents come from? Well, my dad was, parents were of a Danish descent, and his, his parents came over from Denmark. So you were a second generation? Yes. Uh, Dane then? And my mother's folks uh, <clears throat> came from, originally came from way back, came from England and uh, Germany. Do you know about when they came over, either of the parents? Uh, the grandparents, was, no, I have no idea when they came over. My, my parents were both born here in this country. Sometimes this influences what kind of customs you had. Now, did your family, because your dad was Dane, did they dance around the Christmas tree? Uh, <clears throat> they would... Um, they would uh, circle the Christmas tree and sing songs. That was mostly of Christmas songs. And a lot of them would be of the Danish, Danish songs that they would sing. And a lot of them were, the, as the families became more mixed, they would get transferred over to the, the American songs, Silent Night and so forth. Do you think that families were probably closer at that time during the holidays and other times too than what they probably are now? I think there were families were very much closer at that time. It was pretty much strictly family all the way through, except on the doing such as church and school, that would bring in the total group, but I think the families tried to get together, much more so. Do you have um, any advice to young people today if, if they would listen to you? They should work hard or uh, strive to do something or some way to be happy? Well, I think the only thing I could really say in their advice I would be is I think that each and every one that is strive to make something a little bit better and seeing, you know, what, instead of seeing how much trouble there can be caused, I would say that if you can, as much good as you can do, there's room for a tremendous lot of good in this world. And it is, I think we're living in a wonderful country where we can appreciate those things. We take too much for granted. I do think after seeing some of the things overseas that uh, none of us realize how lucky we are over here, both in finances and freedom. That's very true. Two, what do you owe your longevity? Hard work and... <laughs> no, I guess not. I guess it's just unless it's inherited. Most of my mother's, on my mother's side, and quite a few on my father's side, they have lived up into the 80s and 85 to 90. So I'm, I've got a ways to go yet to keep up to them. Well, is there anything else that you can think of that I haven't asked you about? I don't know if we talk too much about, and it might be quite interesting, is in the, the first years of carpentry, about when power tools came in, I think it is probably up in, I know it is up in the 40s, and the late 40s before I ever owned a power, electric power, uh, electric handsaw, and before that everything was ripped with a, a handsaw, planed with a plane, hand plane, where nowadays we have a bench saw and we have a planer, a jointer, we have a shapers, and all sort of tools to run our work, and I don't know if we get much more done than we did before, but, but in the older days of cutting there was generally one person on a job that was the saw man, and he would do nothing but saw. And you would push a hand saw for 10 hours a day, every day of the week. Today it's one electric saw will put them to shame in another mm -hmm. short time. So we've come a long ways in tools and expediting and speeding up buildings. Even though the wages have got higher, it is taken up by the fact that it is more efficiency. Was there electricity in this area much before the 40s? Uh, yes, it came in, the like, first electricity came in here in 1936, 37, 38, REA, when the REA came through at that. Before that, there was very seldom you could get a place where there was electricity. Mm -hmm. It was probably why power tools were a little late in coming, two of them. It must have been 35, 36. They must have been fairly expensive, too, to buy, weren't they? Oh, yes. Did you have to send through the catalog, or how did you... Uh, most of, yes, you had to order... Most Sears or Wards, or yeah. what catalogs would have been... Well, the Sears and Wards were both available, they were the main ones. But uh, there was quite a stock of uh, 
tools carried in the local store at that time for the building trade. We had the, at that time, we carried it mostly to the eight or ten types of hand saws, where nowadays if you, if you can find one or two in the store is the most you'd find. Do you remember the first time you voted, particularly if you may have voted for president? Yes, I think it was the time of Al Smith. Did you vote for him? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer that. <laughs> well, I think I did. <laughs> Usually people remember when they voted for president yeah. first time rather than uh, voting otherwise. It's kind of a momentous ste a step in life. How about your first car? The first car was a used Chevy, a 29 model, what $175, and it's supposed to have been one of the better ones. Got about 30 miles to the gallon or something like no, that? No, it, but it did do up a little better than 20. It uh, had a terrific weakness of the oil would freeze up on us, so we had, in the cold weather you would generally get about a half a mile from home and you'd have to stop and dip a torch in, a tank, uh, torch, homemade torch into the gas tank and light it to heat up the thing to throw out the oil pump. That would do just about every day as you went to work. It sounded real safe. <laughs> yes. I bought a, my first newer car I bought, then I, the next one I, I used that for several years, and then I bought a 36 Plymouth that had less than 10,000 miles on it and bought that for $500 in 1937, so that's how they started going up. I came home from service, and I put in for a Ford two-door, but didn't get it, but that would have cost $1,300. How about your first tractor? You did some farming. You imagine you must have farmed with horses for a while. When did, when did you get a tractor? When I went out to this farm in 53, we bought a used John Deere tractor. Steel wheels or uh, no, that rubber? No, rubber tires on Oh, you were modern. Yeah. It had been converted over. It had, mm -hmm. it, that one had been cut. Steel wheels had been cut off. Uh, I think they started, I was in the service, but they said about in 41 they started putting rubber on most of the tractors. Before that was the steel wheels. On the home place we used a <clears throat> McCormick Deering 1020, that was on steel. Now you have lived in this very, you've gone from the age of farming with horses, you have gone to steel wheel tractors and all the modern conveniences, and now you live among neighbors that farm with horses. That's right. What, what type of neighbors do you have here? <coughs> there are, we have sold out our land and our, also the home farm that was raised on to a Mennonite family who they use tractors but, uh, but have all steel wheels put on them. They use horses for their transportation for on the road. And buggies. And buggy, horse and buggy for all their locomotive uh, for traveling. He also has uh, taken out the power lines and is using a generator for operating his farm with, as, it, as he has become a minister, and that is one of the customs of this, their belief that a minister cannot be used, have the hook up to the power line. They are moving, slowly they are moving up towards more modern equipment. You can, you can sit here in your nice comfortable house, uh, lights by electricity and uh, carpeting on the floor and electric uh, electric stove and you can just look across the field and see all of the see you see your past actually that's right <laughs> yeah they're bringing back some of the the old days makes you appreciate some of these things how easy it is to do how convenient you have it and from what you used to have to do yes i think it's uh, we get out and get in the car and start it up and zip off the town <coughs> If we could think back of the days when we used to have to up and saddle, uh, hitch up a horse to the sleigh and ride in that sleigh down and how cold the fellow could possibly get on a trip, it, uh, I don't think we've, we'd appreciate our cars much more, let alone blanketing the horse and keeping it covered Ooh. while we were away. And having the horse be a little stubborn or something along yeah. the way. In about 19, one of the interesting things is that <clears throat> I can remember back is uh, the first radio I've ever enjoyed listening to. I think in 1920, as we was going to the Frenchtown School, I was in the upper room, and <coughs> Ed Moronko and Osmond Peterson from Wicked came out and offered to put up a radio to see if they couldn't get one that would uh, bring a program, some part of a program in, so they could have it for the, for the program at school. And after spending a day or so building up an antenna and getting the people there for, to listen to it, it turned out that it wasn't until about midnight that they did finally get some music through on this radio, and in order to tune it in, you had to put on earphones to hear it out, and then they would get it tuned in. You used had to use some three to five knobs in order to get it brought in. And about 11 o'clock, they did get enough of a program so they could switch it over to the loudspeaker, and several could listen for about 10 minutes. 
And since then we have come with a pretty simple radio and TV. I think our first TVs come in and started showing up shortly after World War II. You can uh, think of that, Louise. But we didn't have one until no. 1956, so <laughs> my grandparents did. I know shortly after we came back from service, about 1947, my sister and brother, who was crippled, the people from the Danish church went together and made up a donation and gave and bought a TV for my sister and brother, who was crippled. And uh, I think that TV was in the house for two weeks before they really got to see a program. There was always snow. As it, time went by, it keep, kept getting better. So we've taken a lot of those things for granted, the radio and the TV. And they've only been here, you might say, a short time. You've actually seen a lot of change in your lifetime from sure. your Some A lot of change, yeah. yes, in the communications. You've seen a man put on the moon? From, where, from the right. horse and buggy till he's on the moon right now? Right, we're on the moon. You can take, we have an automatic dialer on our phone and we can go in and press a button and a couple seconds later it's ringing out in California without doing anything. When you were in the service, it was man-to-man -man type of combat. That's right. Now you can send a missile from how many hundreds of miles away to destroy someone. You wouldn't know where it was at. And even our cars from your first yes. first Chevy to what they are now have really changed too. Gas mileage isn't any better though. <laughs> the gas mileage hasn't changed. It's still no. very good. <laughs> no, but they talk about the good old days, but I'll stick around with what we got now. <laughs> see what see what there is to come. That's right. <laughs> well, I want to thank you very much for participating in our oral history. And it's a valuable part of our area history because many of these things are not written down and only the people that have actually lived them uh, I think can really tell what they are. So you've helped preserve a little bit of the past here at Withy. It's just nice to have you be part of the past of our community and you have uh, contributed a lot to the community with all the building that you've done and you've taken an active part in the community and with the schools and I know you're active at church also and I just want to thank you very much for allowing us this interview today. Thank you.